OK, so as I was saying, the first phase, you have an idea, a concept, and that concept is to defeat an unmet medical need. That's really the first, uh, the first key point when you're, you're, you're tackling um, uh, the start of a life sciences company. Your checklist, what do you need to know? What do you need to do? And I will go through each one of those, but quickly, you, the first point is you need to test and protect your idea. You need to understand the landscape, the competition. You need to map out your own regulatory process, and there's a whole strategy behind your regulatory uh, work. And you need to identify quite early on what your commercialization strategy will be. If we can go to the next yep. slide. Just uh, on that, that was sort of uh, from a um, from your from a point of view, just from a legal point of view, the things that you would need to think about at this point uh, when you have your ID is what kind of a company do you want to establish? What partners will you need? When will you at some point make a business plan? What would be the government issues that you would need to take care of? At one time, will you need to think about employees and incentives? Uh, how will you think about protecting your rights? How will you along the lines think about investors and financing and what other issues? Will you at this point as well, and that we will come back to later. So the first point, testing and protecting your idea. Your idea should address an unmet medical need. That's the starting point, as I said. You need to understand how it works. Um, and this is quite pertinent when it comes to the uh, biochemical pathways of a biotech product. So it's really being able to explain and detail your mode of action. What pathway does it involve? And that becomes very important when you try to understand what possible off-target effects and what safety issues you may encounter. The second point will be to test your idea. Um, how can you actually demonstrate the efficacy of your technology or your product? You need to find the best model, whether they're in vivo or in vitro. So preclinical models tend to be either in animals um, or in, in, in cells. And again, medtech, biotech differs quite a lot. Um, how predictive is the model that you're using? You need to make sure that it's an approved or accepted uh, model from the, uh, the rest of the community. How reproducible is the data? If you've only gotten the results once, you need to probably redo it a few times to make sure that you are, you're sure of what you have and um, also start to gather your safety data. Then the issue of protecting your idea. Is it patentable? Do you have some level of freedom to operate? What will be your future strategy around protecting your idea? It's very important to make sure that either you will be able to protect it through the further patent strategy um, and that you don't just have the one first patent uh, that you apply for. The timing of when you actually start to work on your patents, that's also very important. The geographic coverage, the big question is always which geographies should you be uh, focused on, obviously, European, US, Australia, but then for some products, maybe some, some of the African countries need to be targeted at South America. There's always the big question of China. Is it better in China to keep things um, as a trade secret or to actually have uh, published patents? And those are big questions and things that you need to discuss quite thoroughly with, uh, with your patent attorney. Um, when it comes to uh, things like software, uh, which I know some of you are working on, there's always the question of keeping things in the black box versus actually having a patent. And obviously, and, and for obvious reasons, um, that may make more sense. The, the, the one thing I would like to uh, bring to your attention is, is the importance of your patent lawyer, making sure that you find someone um, who has the technical or technological or biological knowledge that you need in order to really help you strategize on your, on your patents. Um, a generalist is not useful for our industry, quite frankly, and I've seen a lot of mistakes being made along the way where you know patent attorneys haven't quite understood the landscape and, and have not been able to, to help uh, companies as much as they could have. Um, the fourth point is validate your idea. Um, so this, from my point of view as an investor, I love to see uh, companies that have gone to third parties 
to, to basically ask them to test the technology, to show them that it actually works in another environment by someone who is not connected to the company. Um, Peer-reviewed publications, very important. Again, that validates your concept. Uh, generally, if you're the only one in the field, that's always a little bit scary, but if you have a few other groups, um, thought leaders who are also saying the same things as you are going in the same direction, that's, that's very reassuring. And again, the importance of presenting at key conferences, being invited to present is another uh, validation of your approach. Camilla, did we cover everything on the patent? Sorry, I didn't give you a chance to comment. No, I think we did. I think that one thing for the patent lawyers is that uh, very often we always wind up choosing a local lawyer in the country that you work. For patent lawyers, it's quite doable to get a lawyer which is not necessarily a Norwegian lawyer, uh, but could work in another jurisdiction, but uh, would be a better lawyer to suit your needs as these are sort of international uh, legal issues and not uh, national or local law issues. So uh, I really agree with Marsha that it's important to get good advice on this uh, and not necessarily limited to what you can get uh, in Norway. The next point was the competition and understanding the landscape that you operate in. Um, this is quite obvious, but your, your um, your competition is not local, it's it's global in healthcare. Your product is going to be a success globally, not locally. So re remember to uh, always uh, look at what the uh, what's happening in the rest of the world. That's extremely important. Um, look at the pipeline of the industry. So here, I think this this the, the picture speaks for itself. There's no point in adding horsepower to a carriage when someone is developing the Tesla. And often we forget to look at what's happening in the pipeline. And you have this, this will mean actually going to PubMed and looking at the publications. It means going into uh, clinicaltrials.gov and looking at what uh, kind of uh, clinical trials are being done in the indications that you are targeting. But it's an extremely important exercise because it, it'll take you 10 years possibly to get to the market from, from the time when you start 15 if you're a biotech company. And by the time you get to the market, the landscape is very different from when you started. So, for example, in cancer, you know, we had chemotherapy 15 years ago. Today, we have CAR T cells. Uh, if you if you rely on the chemo as your competitive landscape, that's that's history now. Um, the other important point is to follow the trends in the industry. Um, so again, here um, we know obviously with what happened uh, with COVID this year, we have seen how uh, infectious diseases and, and COVID in particular has really made a huge impact on uh, especially the digital health companies. Um, some of you are working on uh, remote patient monitoring, on telemedicine, and this has really been uh, an important um, uh, catalyst for companies in this sector. I, I put this quote here, AI is not going to replace doctors, but rather doctors who use AI will replace those who do not. And I think it's a really nice way of illustrating how technology um, and the trends in AI are actually going to be integrated in the, in the way we, we perform healthcare rather than you know, eliminate, uh, eliminate the way we, we do healthcare or change it completely. Um, another important uh, trend to follow is the brain. There's a lot of work being done in neuroscience today. So again, thinking if that's the field that you want to be in, there, there's a lot of work being done. And finally, I put gender medicine in the middle, but it's actually uh, possibly you, you would think of it as precision medicine. And precision medicine is essentially having uh, targeted therapies for specific uh, conditions. So it's not looking at the patient as an average patient, but looking at the patient as an individual. We've seen over the years a huge transformation in diagnostics in cancer, for example. We, uh, I was talking about chemotherapy. That was this, it still is in a lot of cases the standard of care, and it's given to everyone um, in the same way. And the diagnostics are based on where the tumor is localized in the body. Is it a tumor in the kidney, in the brain, in the liver, et cetera? What we are seeing is that the whole way of diagnosing cancer is switching from organ to actual underlying mutations in the, uh, the tumor. So it'll be a RAS mutation 
a T to A uh, mutation, which will have a targeted therapy for that specific mutation. And it will not matter anymore whether it's in the, the lungs or in the pancreas. It's going to be the underlying mutation which is targeted by this, uh, by this therapy. And that's an important transformation in the sector. The next slide is really just to remind you, um, and I've put in a few, um, a few journals, keep track of the global news in your industry. Um, these might actually be some of the ones that could be of interest to you. The Medical Futurist tends to have weekly um, reviews of uh, the digital health sector. Endpoints has a lot of stuff on pharma. Fierce MedTech covers a lot of the MedTech stories. Antmini.com is everything, MRI, uh, x-rays, etc. Labiotech is across the board. Keep track of the clinicaltrials.gov in the field that you're interested in and the changes in the regulatory framework. So the message here is just keep track of the, of the, of the global news in your industry. Um, the next point is on the regulatory process. A lot of you are um, already quite well versed in this field, but I, it's, it's important to just remind um, those of you who are starting that uh, there is a regulatory process which is extremely rigorous and it's time consuming. Um, for a biotech company or for a new drug to reach the market, it takes about 15 to 20 years from the discovery of a new drug or a new target to when you can actually start to make money. So it's a very long time. And that's due to the fact that you have to go through these regulatory hurdles. When you're in preclinical, you actually have a 4% chance, approximately 4% chance of reaching the market successfully. Uh, it goes up to about 10% when you have safety data in phase one and then 25% from phase two and 45 when you start your phase three. The medtech space obviously is a little bit different and the regulatory process is more about proving safety, uh, getting your C marking in, in, in Europe or your 510K or de novo in, uh, through the FDA. But again, it is a time consuming uh, process. There's a, um, there's a strategy behind it and you need to think about how to get that done. Um, make sure you bring the right regulatory expertise on board as early as possible. Now, different stages of the, thank you, different stages of the company requires different level of um, regulatory rigor. I'm not an expert in the field, but I know that it's extremely important to find the right person to help you and uh, that planning for this is key and don't wait too long. So choose your consultant wisely, choose your notified body wisely, whether you go for DNV in Norway or uh, the, the, the UK, uh, Sweden, Germany, they all have some different uh, advantages and it's, it's good to speak to consultants who deal with all of them, who can actually tell you which is best suited for your type of product. So again, involve your trusted regulatory consultant in the dialogues with the notified body. I thought it was of interest. This is a, a chart that has been updated, um, I, I guess, earlier this fall, and it basically shows you the FDA approvals for artificial intelligence based devices in medicine. And this is interesting because originally people weren't quite sure how the regulatory systems were going to approve things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and software for med tech which change all the time, which you upgrade, which you uh, tweak with, and which are learning. Um, but now they have actually established fairly good guidelines and, um, and, and there's, a, there's a proper way of actually assessing them and getting through the regulatory system. <coughs> Sorry. So the whole approval process is now fully functional and um, the processes of approval are both de novo and 510k. There's a very good review of this whole uh, system, if ever it's of interest, in Nature that was just published, as I said earlier this fall. We're not moving, Sergio. <laughs> Can you get to the next slide? Any questions? 
No doubt. Please don't hesitate to interrupt and uh, ask questions or, or make comments. Always happy to, to, uh, to hear contributions for, from people. Um, so the next stage, uh, the next thing you need to take into consideration is your commercialization strategy. And for those of you who are working in medtech, regulatory is not really your biggest problem or your biggest challenge. It's, it's, it's actually commercialization. So if you have a technology platform, you should think wisely about choosing your first indication and designing your clinical trial. You need to think about which indication will get you to the market the fastest. You need to think about the patient recruitment rate. If you go for a niche indication, it may take you a long time to recruit for a full trial. But if you go for a popular indication, it may be very crowded. Um, you may have some advantages if you go back to what we were saying earlier about having the relationships with the KOLs who test your technology in their own lab or in their own environment. You invite them early on in the preclinical setting that they actually get comfortable with your technology. And if they are KOLs who are both scientists and clinicians, they can be your best ambassadors and your first PIs for your cl clinical trials. And they are convinced about the um, the technology and they basically uh, help you do the clinical development. Um, another point is to consider when you are thinking about your re your commercialization is which indication has the highest pricing potential and the highest reimbursement rate. And this brings me to the data that you see here on the charts. Um, basically on the left hand side you've got all the orphan drugs or the niche indications where basically it's chronic management of disease for 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 very very small patient populations and which go up to you know 400k uh, per patient per year uh, and because it's only one drug on the market for the whole population they can basically price whatever they want at whatever level they want then you have the new, the more novel therapies, which offer a cure and some of the examples on the right hand side by Novartis, Spark and Gilead basically demonstrate um, a cure for diseases like uh, hepatitis C in the case of Gilead. So Valdi uh, came to the market a few years ago and basically the price tag was $80,000. It was very expensive. Hepatitis C is quite a large patient population. So for example, Australia negotiated with Gilead the so-called Netflix model, whereby the country says we will pay you X million dollars per year for our entire population. And whether the population is 20,000 or 200,000, the amount should cover everything. And that means that the price tag goes from approximately 80,000 to 60,000, but it gives security to Gilead as they have visibility on what's coming into their bank account. So that is a that's something to think about when you're uh, doing your pricing strategy and negotiating or speaking with um, with payers. The Netflix model, the other one that is being used uh, in the case of um, CAR T cells. Um, so a price tag of four hundred thousand dollars is quite expensive. But if you think about what they have said is basically you pay, but if after a month the patient is not better or cured, you get your money back. So that is a way of of uh, dealing with uh, high high prices. Sorry, Sujit. We have a question from yes. Jeremy now. Yep. Jeremy, you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, I just wanted um, for everyone, for the audience, uh, when you talk about bringing in KOLs, is that generally a paid thing? Are they expected uh, some remuneration for their time and effort um, that they're putting in? So, so if you think about the KOL, so there are two ways to think about this. Um, if they are brought in early on to actually test the technologies, they will most likely um, have either a grant that they apply for with you, but typically if you pay them, it, they, they sort of lose their independence and their KOL status. So you need to be a little bit careful and making sure that they test it in their lab and they kick the tires and they are as objective as possible. Um, if you are asking them in order to be able to have the results and, and, and have them as a as advisor to you, then it's a different dynamic. So it really depends on what, what the end game is. Does that answer, Jeremy? Yep, great. Thank you. 
obviously when you have a PI running your clinical trial, the whole thing changes and, and you're paying the hospital and, and that includes fees to, the, uh, to, to, to everybody involved. But a PI, just to be clear, um, in the US, and I think it might be different in Europe, but if the FDA, un, under the FDA guidelines, you're not allowed to pay to have your advisor on your scientific advisory board and paid by the company or earning shares. There's a whole, uh, you need to check that. Yeah. That okay. makes sense. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Um, yes, so I've added this slide, um, the tipping point. Some of you may know this. This is not recent work. It was actually work done by Rogers in 1962, and it's the diffusion of innovation. But I thought it was a very interesting, it, it, interesting concept, actually. It basically tells you that in order to reach commercial success, you need 15% of a community's population to adopt your idea. And that basically is the critical mass for the innovation to be spread and to have its own momentum. Now, the key question is how do you get to that 15% and who are the 15% uh, of this, uh, this population? So if you look at the bell curve, you have 2.5% who are innovators. Um, those would be the people who basically love to try new things. Um, they are typically young and they look for these uh, for, for innovations. I would say in the case of, of medtech biotech, um, I would tend to think the, you know, the, the, the doctors who have just, um, who are just uh, starting their medical career, they're the ones who are really in touch with the, with the new technologies. I always think it's a good idea for companies to, um, to look at what's happening in the medical schools. If you have the possibility to present to the medical students, not too early on, but when they get to, you know, start to think about their, their, their specialties and, and what they want to work on and you, and you target those. Um, obviously, they're stretched and have a, a lot of work, but they're the, at the age group and the mindset that typically wants to adopt new things. Then you have your early adopters. Um, again, hard to define, but for each sector you will have, for each types of, of well, for each indication or, or technology, you will have people who basically look to the innovators in order to uh, take on new new technologies. Then your early majority, 34%, your late majority, and the laggards are the ones that basically you shouldn't spend any time trying to convince. They will only come on board when they have no, nothing left, basically. They're the ones who are still trying to use the rotary phones <laughs> when we're dealing with iPhones. So I wouldn't spend any time on, on those. But if you can... If you can spend time trying to understand your market and, and trying to see who your innovators and your early adopters are, I think you would you would uh, benefit uh, greatly and your commercial your commercialization strategy would benefit greatly. This brings me to the second phase. Um, maybe we can take a break uh, and, and see if there are any questions. Just a two, three minute. Uh, break to, to see if anybody has questions or Camilla, do you have any comments to the first section? Sergio, we can launch into then the second phase. Oh, I learned a lot in this first section. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> okay, so now the second phase. You So you had an idea, a concept to defeat an unmet medical need and now it's time to establish a company to develop and commercialize your idea. So let's recap. You have tested and patented or patented your, your, your trademark uh, secrets, etc. You have a clear understanding of your competitive landscape, both existing and upcoming. So again, don't forget the pipeline. You have planned your regulatory pathway with your trusted advisors, and you have a pretty good understanding of your potential commercialization uh, strategy. And now what next? it's time to establish your company. Establishing a company is essentially when you, uh, there's something missing <laughs> on the chart. So on the right hand side, you have the shareholders and you have two blue boxes. And on the left hand side, you would have the founder. And on the right hand side, you have the investor. And below you have the company AS, where the, the operations, the development is actually taking place for your technology. So being an owner, 
you as a founder, please, please make sure you own your shares in your company, in the company that the company IS, um, as a company. So you should be founder IS owning shares in company IS, and founder IS owns shares alongside investor IS, if that makes any sense to you. Um, Camilla, I think it would be important if you could just explain why it is so important for people to own shares as a company and not as an individual. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, it goes. I mean, I think it goes without saying that you will operate your, um, you will do your business in a uh, company, and the reason why you want to have a company, a limited liability company, is of course that you have limited liability. You're only sort of in charge of the uh, equity, and a company is also. Uh, it's it's well organized. You have legislation. You have everything to operate it. And then a lot of people think that okay, that suffices that I have uh, that company and I can own the shares uh, personally. And the reason why we are emphasizing that you need to own your shares also through a company uh, is that uh, for tax reasons uh, you will be able to uh, sell shares, uh, distribute shares, and sort of change how this company is operated without that having tax implications on your side. The gains of a company, whenever you get to that, is sort of, it's taxed in the company, but the surplus remains there. So also, if you own through a company uh, and, from, and you get distribution or you sell, then your profit will remain in that company and you will not be taxed until you take that uh, money out. And I know that uh, people think that, you know, I can be organized at the later stage and we often see that problem uh, when we deal with these kind of companies that uh, one or several of the founders own their companies personally and we try to reorganize it uh, doing mergers and demergers, etc. in order for them to own shares uh, through holding companies. And these, uh, this takes quite a lot of time and it's quite costly and it's complicated and it does not necessarily work. So uh, we can't really emphasize enough the importance of owning uh, your shares to the company uh, to start with. But yeah. when you transfer the shares from your individual ownership to the IS that you own, yeah. doesn't that have also tax implications? That has tax implications. I was saying you shouldn't from the beginning you own from it the as beginning, an from the start. company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but if you transfer it from a personally, from owning them personally to a company at a stage where there hasn't really been any change in the value of the shares, then it doesn't really matter because then you're not sort of selling shares to your own company and making a profit that you have to tax from. But if you own your shares personally and you want to transfer it to a uh, company uh, at the later stage, where the company and the shares have uh, increased in value, then uh, you sell shares to something. You will have to sell these shares into a company, and then you actually make a profit, uh, and you have to tax from that without ever having seen any cash yet. So that's becoming the problem, and that's what we sort of sometimes try to avoid by doing a merger, the merger, it's fishun, fishun, uh, and uh, it can work. It will take three to six months and cost. 200, 300,000 in uh, legal fees and auditor's fees. So best to just start with the, with the company. And, and I think it makes the other shareholders who came in as investors, uh, so capital providing shareholders, very nervous. I mean, it's not something people like to, to be involved with. So mm -hmm. avoid, avoid issues uh, and, and start uh, first day property by setting up a company that owns shares in your uh, operating company. Um, we have a question yeah. from Jeremy. Yeah. Jeremy, go ahead. Um, just, just very briefly, uh, it's relatively simple to set up one of those companies because I've done it myself, um, but I, I suppose you would recommend getting some legal advice to do that to, for the sake of correctness. Um, could uh, both of you, or, or uh, maybe you, Camilla, um, indicate how much you would generally pay a lawyer to help you set up a company and structure um, um, for an early stage company? I think uh, um, to set up a company uh, in Norway, uh, if you just set up a company, you know, uh, for, for owning your shares, 
um, the minimum share capital you need to put, the minimum amount of equity you need to put into the company is 30,000. Uh, and I think that can be done. I mean, there's you can Google it online and it's really quite easy to, um, to do it. And I think quite a lot of people can do that themselves. And I think if you want to, there are uh, places where you can buy off the shelf companies and uh, most law, law firms will also do that and that will normally cost 50,000 uh, knocks uh, and then you would get uh, a company uh, with a set of bylaws and they will help you change the um, change the board of directors so that you have sort of a, a, a startup uh, for your company. So I think uh, just setting up a company and, and getting off to the right foot that's not costly and um, it's uh, it's very easy and it's very quickly done. So your recommendation for the sake of correctness and uh, future comfort of your shareholders and, and yourself would be to buy an off-the-shelf um, solution? No, I think whether you know, that was just an example of how it can be done, whether you do an off-the-shelf or you establish it yourself uh, with the help, I mean, doing it online uh, or uh, getting help from your uh, auditor or if you have a lawyer at this stage, I think that's sort of uh, equally good solutions to get to where you want to go. I don't think there's much you can uh, do wrong in establishing a, uh, a company and you have to register it with um, the Brennerstundsregisterna and uh, if there's something you haven't done correctly then uh, it won't be registered. So at this point, any way of setting up a company uh, will uh, will suffice. And um, I think it's 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 uh, people think it's more complicated than it actually is. It's very it's very straightforward. Okay, great. I did it as a foreigner, so it's not too bad. It's it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Uh, the second point is bringing investors on board. Um, make sure you think of your next rounds of financing and the voice of experience is is extremely important. Uh, one key thing which again this is a you know experience uh, has, has shown me that you, we you really need to think about uh, the symbiotic relationship between idea and capital. Capital needs to find ideas, good ideas to invest in and ideas need to find capital to help it grow. So it is truly a symbiotic relationship and when it works well, it works really well. Just want to comment at this stage also, um, when you bring in uh, sort of investors, it's also important to think about the ownership between the founders. Sometimes it's just one founder, but sometimes there are also several founders. Um, and I think uh, there's really no clear answer on how you should divide ownership between founders. Uh, it has a little bit with who sort of someone brings in capital, someone brings in uh, sort of the ID, someone does a lot of work. Uh, but I think it's important when you sort of start to uh, thinking about bringing in external investors that you know how you want the ownership between the founders to be divided and to think ahead and uh, who will sort of lead this company ahead, who will be involved uh, long term. Uh, you don't really want uh, free riders at this point. There's something about someone maybe brought in some capital, but they stopped working in the company or they're not really active anymore. They're not doing a lot of work. And at this time, I think it's important to have those discussions and figure out uh, really, will you help out bring this company further along? And if not, there's not really a lot of point in someone then having quite a big chunk of uh, the company because there's only 100% of the company and the investors will want their part. So uh, at some point, founders will sort of be diluted. And then it's important that when you're diluted, that the active, important founders still get to keep a big chunk of the company. So uh, can be hard discussions in an early phase, but I think it's really important to have them. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, uh, there's a stage where, you know, the founder is extremely important and then a stage where the founder is no longer important. And I think people need to remember to, to be quite pragmatic. The whole point is to bring the technology forward. And sometimes the founders are able to migrate from being innovators to being uh, business developers and, and people who can continue in the CEO. But very few, I have to say, have managed to to go the whole way through. And again, think about your shareholding 
and think about the value creation, it's better to be part of something that is super successful and own a, a, a smaller chunk of it, but let people who know how to, to run the companies um, take over than to own 100% of something that is worthless. So again, back to Camilla's point, uh, there are stages where founder is super important and founder less important. Yeah. So on, on that point, I think, you know, typically the uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, or the founders, uh, will just go and hunt for the next uh, investor because they're cash strapped. And, you know, what you're saying is that they should go, you know, broader and do some legwork in terms of selecting the right investors who to tackle, not to just, you know, go to the first man on the street. But there's another aspect that I think a lot of people underestimate. And because they're cash strapped, they go and need consultancy. They need, you know, someone to work with them, developing whatever. And they will basically give them equity in uh, in return. So is is that good value for money? Or is that potentially the most expensive way of financing your company? Yeah. Yeah, we'll get back to that a little bit later yeah, on. It's but, a really uh, good point. <laughs> it's, uh, it can be good value for money and it can be a very expensive way to, uh, to fund your company. But uh, yeah. We, we get back to that point, okay. but it is a super important point. And uh, let's, uh, yeah. let's yeah. Uh, return to that. Yeah. So the next slide is. Um, well, being a founder, uh, it, it, being a founder or an innovator, as, as we say, is, is not easy. I read, I read sorry, recently a short piece by Simon Sinek, who states that there are two types of people who can be divided according to the way they see the world. So you have people who focus on the thing they want and work to find ways to get them to succeed. And you have people who focus on all the things standing in their way and who can't see beyond, be, beyond those obstacles. So in Simon Sinek's view, a founder, an innovator, is someone who basically is the first type, focus on the thing they want and work to find ways to succeed. And the investor, well, investors typically are always going to look for ways um, not to invest, basically. It, it, it's, you know, what are the reasons not to invest rather than investing? And it's your job as founder and innovator to share your vision and get investors to buy into your vision. There's a question from uh, Jonas. Jonas, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for a great presentation so far. Um, I had a question before regarding the thing around um, uh, uh, having co-founders and then uh, during a uh, development, uh, co-founders tend, some can try to, uh, they don't want to be as big a part of it anymore. Is there a rule of thumb regarding how much equity they should own in order to not become a liability for the company and still have, uh, if they had, they have contributed, but they kind of, if they have to leave the, co leave the company or so from an investor point of view? Does that make sense, the question? No, no, that makes sense. Camilla, do you want to? <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't think there's a, I don't think there's a rule of uh, thumb. And uh, I think uh, basically when co-founders start a company, you know, if there's three, they, they own one third each. And then for <laughs> various reasons, maybe one will leave the company and the two others will uh, drive the company forward. And uh, I think that's often a discussion between uh, the founders, how do we uh, how do we take it from here when one of you when one doesn't want to be involved anymore? Uh, I think uh, typically investors uh, will uh, invest in a company because uh, there's an idea, but they will also invest in a management team and uh, a team of founders, and they will not. Um, they will not necessarily be in favor of the idea that a large chunk of the equity is held by someone who's not actively involved in the company and uh, who will not contribute uh, sort of in man hours or in activity to bring the company forward and who will not uh, add equity either at some point because it's not necessarily someone who has a lot of cash to sort of support the company financially. So I think uh, it's a really, really hard discussion that founders need to have. Uh, but I think if, uh, it's important that the ones that will be actively involved should have the largest uh, shareholding. And uh, yeah. 
of course you can't dilute someone sort of uh, without I mean you can't take someone's shares or I mean anything so you, there's rights involved in this but I think it would be important that uh, if someone chooses to not be that maybe they sell their shares to the other shareholders or that they accept to be diluted and that they keep sort of an interest in the company because they might sort of have been involved but it's it can't be very influential no, I, and, and that's right. I think what we have seen in, um, in some of the cases where this scenario uh, came up is that uh, the co-founders who remained with the company bought out the founders who wanted to leave the company. And, and in some cases, it was actually you know, a little bit of a dispute. And, 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 if, it, and if there is a dispute, it is very important to you know, not have too much animosity in the share early on because that just becomes, that just gets worse and worse. So buying the the uh, the co-founders who are no longer involved, buying them out, um, would be, in my experience, the preferred way forward. And then, what value do you give the company to the shares, etc.? Obviously, if you founded the company uh, together, uh, there's probably very little value add. Uh, you know that you will need to, if the founder is leaving, you you buy them at the price. Uh, or maybe a little bit higher than than uh, the price uh, when it was established. If it's later on and, and a lot of value has been created and, and investors have come in, then it's a little bit too late in the game. But if it's still early on, I think you can you can uh, the, the separation is better. The other point is um, if you can't buy them out because too expensive and and etc. and they don't want to sell, um, then it might be worth having um, some form of shareholder agreement um, between the founders, between the, the, the shareholders in the company, which either regulates the way the board is established so that they don't have more of a say than what than at the AGM, that they don't actually demand a board seat or, or something like that. Does that answer? Sorry, Sergio. Yeah, just to add on that, do, do you see it as more challenging if a company is spun off from a larger organization or even from a university or whatever or it's you know is there more disputes in that case than if there were two co-founders or three co-founders as individuals like you know inventors versus uh, spinning out from an existing larger organization no i don't i don't think there's a big difference i think uh Every company is sort of a little bit individual and it depends on the individuals and how they started out and the level of uh, conflict sort of varies very much. You know, sometimes there's no conflict, there's no shareholders agreement and everything just sort of sorts itself out. And sometimes you can have the best ideas and really great people and they wind up in all sorts of conflicts uh, regardless. And um, it's yeah. uh, it's very individual. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking is I've, I've been, uh, you know, uh, in touch with a couple of companies recently where they spun out of a university or they have an agreement to use data from a university, for example. And then when they do, uh, let's say, the initial uh, uh, cooperation agreement, they don't establish a cost on the use of that data or on the IP that may, uh, you know, arise from it. And they say we will transfer it at a fair uh, market, value. market value. So that can be one kroner or 100 million kroners, depending on how it evolves. So that can put, you know, entrepreneurs that need the data at a very, you know, big disadvantage. Um, but that's not really an ownership uh, issue. That's more of an issue that you have started a company where you depend on something on. Uh, from a third party and you haven't entered into a proper agreement on how uh, this very important factor in your operations shall be dealt with. Um, so um, I think that's sort of an operational issue between the company and whoever sort of the data that you need access to that that should be regulated very properly. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think. Uh, but but to that point, getting legal advice as as early on as possible for those types of things is extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know having having a trusted advisor lawyer. Who actually helps you negotiate whether it's the transfer of IP out of the university or or, or a spin-off from the company or what you're talking about data having access to data all those things get, get some legal advice it's worth 
spending that money at Early that stage, on. yeah, rather than trying to fix it five years later when you have something which is w worth a lot more. Yeah. And I think uh, basically, I mean, having done a lot of diligence on these kind of companies uh, on behalf of investors, what they're always looking at is this question. Do they own their own IP? Do they have something from third parties? Is it developed by someone else? Will there be an issue? And nobody really, really wants to touch a company where there's sort of question marks related to IP or uh, sort of there's factors or the a university or a hospital or third parties can say, you know, this partly belongs to us. So I cannot stress enough the importance of sort of getting these types of agreements uh, in place early on. Yeah. And that includes <clears throat> ownership of IP, of course, but ownership of competence. Like you said, an investor is investing in not only an idea, but a team, a management, management team. team. Yep. So there are companies where they spin out from a larger organization and let's say the brain power is not owning the spin out necessarily. And then, you know, basically if I'm an investor, I'm looking at that company, what am I investing on? You know, the brain power is what I'm investing on. If they don't own it, they don't have ownership. They just walk and my company's, you know, the, the company I buy is just an empty shell. So um, I think, like you said, the legal advice early on to you know, pinpoint these small, uh, you know, small details that then in five years time make a huge problem. Mm. Yes, and I think it's, um, I think people actually tend to be a bit, uh, I mean, at least sometimes you, people can tend to be a bit sloppy with these things. And I remember this is quite a few years ago when we diligence for a fund, uh, one, a company which is now listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange and quite successful in this sort of area, and they didn't own their IP and they had already professional investors who somehow either didn't do their due diligence or they did their due diligence and figured this out and it was supposed to be uh, arranged and it wasn't and we were sort of investing quite a big uh, big chunk of money at this point and would become owner of 30% of the company and saying you you will need to, to fix this and it took months for them to then renegotiate all their agreements and ensure that they had their IP and it was a bit it was very surprising um, so, uh, yeah, this is somewhere where everybody has to go back and just make sure that they have uh, their uh, their files and their IP and stuff like this in order. But why do you think that problem arises? Because, you know, it, it's, it seems quite obvious that, you know, if you own a company, nobody's going to want to own part of that company if you don't have any IP inside. So it, the problem arises because people have let's say too much goodwill and they trust each other and then you know we'll figure out later on or they're just simply not aware or i think it has something to do with the fact that a lot of of the founders that we have encountered are not necessarily used to doing these things so unless there's a a, a recipe book that they follow they they will assume that things are going to sort themselves out that everybody does it this way mm -hmm. that's one of the one of the issues that i've seen myself um so they, they, they're not used to negotiating with either the, you know, the, the company that they're spinning out of or um, whatever it is that they are, the, the, the original IP comes from. And it's, it's really just asking the question. That's why Norway Health Tech, for example, is such an important asset to the industry because it does provide this feedback to founders who have an idea, raise the flag and then get the, you know, the steps. Um, so, uh, Camilla, maybe you have a different uh, answer to that question, but no, I think I think it's I think it's correct, and I think it's very often with with spin-outs, and that you know you just keep on working. You were mm. you were once at, at one place, and now you're in a different place, but you just keep doing the same thing that you did all along, and you don't sort of uh, put emphasis on the fact that there was actually a move from where uh, I originally worked to where I sp spun out to, or if you collaborate with someone, then you sort of well. This was my idea. I collaborate with A, B, and C, but it's my idea, and you know, why would anyone else get any right to this? Yeah. And then yeah. you're just not aware of uh, sort of the complications, and and uh, quite often it can be fixed. And you know, the third parties may agree that yeah, no, you're completely right. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a conflict. But for investors, when they go in and look at it, it's just you know, you get sort of. A warning sign in your head when why didn't you think about this sooner and if you didn't think about this sooner what are the other things that you didn't think about that we would expect you to think about so there's something about how you project yourself and that this is just a very 
uh, important uh, part in projecting yourself like a professional that has sort of good control of the most important elements of your business. Yeah. And again, it's also back to the IP strategy, uh, writing patents and having the right patent attorneys, making sure that you are really protecting as, as widely and as correctly as possible. I mean, composition of matter versus use patents, you know, this is definitely more valuable. But if this is all you can get, then at least get as much as possible and do as, as many experiments to extend the use in different indications, etc. So it, it really is a little bit case by case and um, people's uh, own experience. Yep. Uh, yeah. But I think bottom line is most, not all, but most entrepreneurs are very technically focused and they kind of, you know, focus on just yep. taking the product to market fast, fast, develop, develop, and they forget a lot of these details. And if they're not advised, they're not part of the cluster or an incubator, or even talk to a lawyer or, yeah. you know, an expert they just, advisor, they just, you know, go through mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. just realize it when they hit their head. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Yeah, next slide. Any questions at this stage? No? Just shoot if you have questions. So back to um, sharing your vision. So what I was saying earlier is in order to convince investors, um, you, you need to be able to share your vision. Start with the why. And this is really how great leaders inspire everyone to take action with them. And again, I, I, I reference this back to Simon Sinek's uh, golden circle. And, and the why why are you a founder and innovator? Why are you doing what you are doing? Explain to the investors your why. Hit that emotional streak with your audience, the limbic brain, the one that basically makes you feel certain things, um, helps you in your decision making based on how you feel inside. That would be the first thing you hit. Then you want to hit the neocortex, which is the more rational thinking and analytical thought. So you basically you want to convey to your investors um, why it is that you're doing what you're doing and for them to buy into that why. They want, investors want to be part of a company that will develop an antiviral drug against COVID-19. Um, they want to help uh, get people out of wheelchairs after a spinal cord injury. They want to help sponsor research into brain diseases and degeneration. Um, they want to provide the means to bring precision medicine to Norway, for example. So that's, that's the why. Get your why sorted out. Obviously, credibility is key. So once you have your vision and your why explained to your investors, they buy into it, you need to back it up with your what. <laughs> and that's your data, that's your KOLs, that's your patent position, your regulatory plans, your reimbursement strategy, um, obviously your integrity, your transparency, and these are key for credibility and key for to, to help bring the right investors. And when I say the right investors, I mean investors who who want to share or who share your vision and, and for you to basically have this symbiotic relationship with your investor group. Sorry, we need to just yeah. Uh, so you said we would take a break at some point. Yes, yeah. now we're halfway. We in the yeah yeah if we are to um, do very good a short break before we start on the on the finance financing, financing. Yeah. Yeah. very good so anyone has uh, any uh, questions at this stage uh, we'll take uh, yes there is one uh, hand raised from who oh sorry my bad so if you have any uh, questions now it's the time otherwise uh, we'll cook take them. five minutes. Yeah, we can take, uh, let's say we start at uh, 10 past. Yeah, super. Yeah. Good, so good. Um, we'll be back in uh, five minutes. Just take a buy a break. Thank you for uh, being patient with us. Yeah, see you soon.
So here we are again. Uh, welcome back. So we're ready to start after a short sure ventilation <laughs> breathing break. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So let's go to the next slide, uh, Sergio. Not we could go to the next slide. Yeah. Very good. So to, to take a few minutes on uh, financing at this stage, uh, we thought would be uh, would be good before we actually uh, dive into more corporate governance. So just very quickly, a financing trend at the moment is positive generally. Uh, generalist investors in Norway have made money. You all know the Algeta story, and you've seen the recent announcement on Vaxibody, um, which has now listed on the uh, Mercure market. So obviously people have uh, have made some money on the back of, of these uh, success stories, and there are others, as, of course. Globally, we are seeing more money going into healthcare funds. So the VC funds are actually raising much larger funds than they did in the past, and of course, this has something to do with, with COVID-19 and, and the uh, extremely um, intense focus on, on healthcare at the moment. Um, we are seeing more and more VCs from other countries. I mean, to, to be clear, we have just a, 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 you know, two or three VCs in Norway that focus on our sector uh, at the moment. So the VC environment is not very, uh, very active in Norway, but we are seeing a lot more VCs from other countries looking at technologies in Norway and I, I and I hesitate to say, but I will say it. It seems as though more money is chasing fewer technologies than before. So, it, the, you know, I've never seen this in the sector um, up until now. It's been the other way around, desperately, uh, desperate technologies seeking money. But it seems as though now people are there's there's a lot more money in the system. Um, we've also seen industry in Norway uh, placing scouts on the ground. Uh, so I, I'm sure a lot of you have had dialogues with some of the large pharma and medtech companies. So they're actually looking more actively at technologies that can complement their own pipelines or their own technologies. And COVID-19 has, uh, you know, that, that, that has catalyzed the uptake of digital health globally. Um, it, it, digital health was always on the sideline and we knew it, it was coming. Uh, telemedicine has been around for 40 years or 30 years, uh, starting with NASA, but it, it took a long time and it took actually a, a pandemic for, um, for GPs to actually start to use telemedicine routinely and for insurance companies and natural, na, uh, national health services across European countries to start to reimburse. So these, this is positive trend in the industry generally. Um, fundraising, so the big questions. When to raise money? Um, well, general rule, don't wait until your bank account is completely empty. Um, these are obvious questions and answers, but just very quickly, um, the types of investors to, to target. Again, as Camilla stated earlier, you have different stages and you know, looking at uh, friends, family, fools, I guess, would be the first stage. Um, then you have the seed investors, the VC, the family offices, the specialists, etc. But you, you should look at your, you know, at the initial stages at your own local environment and then start to branch out a little bit towards the uh, larger um, investor groups. And again, going to conferences, meeting, not geographically or not physically, but being able to access some of the conferences in order to be able to, uh, to meet some of the other investors. Um, how to find and approach investors? I would say, you know, Jeremy, uh, who is on the call today, has developed a tremendous network and is getting an increasing number of interested investors. I think it would be great to to make sure that you you speak to um, to Jeremy from Norway Health Tech uh, as a starting point. Um, and again, go to conferences and present your technologies. Um, how to prepare before approaching investors? Make sure your deck is what the industry, what the VCs, what the investors are used to, see, to seeing. And again, having it reviewed by people who know what to present and how to build your story is very important. Remember the why and remember your data. Investors want to know that they can trust you and your data. Uh, valuation, um, I guess we could spend another two hours on that topic. It's a tough question. Um, typically one that 
depends really on the relationship that you have with the investors, especially if it's your first round of financing. If you already have investors on board, then valuation is a slightly different story. If you go with a full, well, sorry, if you go with a, a, a book that has already a few investors uh, uh, anchoring the, uh, the financing, so your existing shareholder base, then that's one uh, very different scenario from when you go when the book is completely empty. Uh, in terms of your rounds of financing, obviously um, making sure that you anchor your next rounds, are that's a very important point. So if you can get investors who you know will be able to carry you, carry you through your next round is, a, is an important strategy. Camilla, maybe you want to comment? Yeah. Um, yes, I think, uh, well, what we generally see is, of course, that uh, startups, they tend to finance in several rounds, which is, uh, of course, due to um, a lack of track record, but also because maybe uh, a limited need in the start. So there's really no uh, reason to keep sort of cash dead in the company because startups can only do so much in the first uh, round. So, they, you know, you fundraise for uh, to fund your company for the next 6, 12, 18 months, and then you fundraise again. And I think uh, it's also smart because you can get a better valuation down the road, so don't fundraise too much because that might actually wind up in a greater dilution than if you wait a little bit, just get you, uh, one year ahead, and then you can get a better valuation uh, and uh, fundraise again. Um, but then, of course, you like Marsha just said, there's positive financing now, so you never quite know when the window will close. So there can be reasons to just try and get uh, more cash at hand. And also, if you get more cash, of course, you can have a more speedy growth. You can uh, hire a little bit more people. You can sort of uh, get your business going and get more um, dynamics uh, into it. I think also, um, in terms of fun uh, raising, I think if you if you stay ready for this, then you will not have to prepare. And I think it's inc incredibly important when you fundraise that you have your sort of you have your docs uh, in order, that you have your accounts that they are proper, that you have your corporate documentation in order, that you have your important agreements in order, that you have sort of a good knowledge of everything that has to do with uh, your company, your IP strategy, etc. So that uh, this is sort of uh, ready in some sort of an archive and you sort of just add to it uh, as you go along because you will fundraise more than once and you shouldn't sort of be doing, oh no, we have to fundraise again and then you have to gather up everything and you know, oh, we have to do our accounts, oh, we have to do this and that. Just do this on a continuous basis. Uh, basis. Yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, important uh, when you go along, I think. Um, when you uh, do your uh, investor presentations should be based on the business plan of uh, your company. So you need to sort of have what's your business concept, where is where's the strategy and you sort of need to align uh, your investor presentation with uh, that and with sort of all the elements that Marsha sort of uh, talked about uh, in the beginning. Um, I think it's important to decide what team will you fundraise with, who will go with investors. I mean, you can be the most brainy uh, sort of scientist, does not necessarily mean that you will be able to fundraise one knock. If you're not able to communicate, then someone who sits at the other end will just say, will have no belief in you. So if you have someone who's more of a marketing person, even though it may not be the be the uh, the founder or the one that has the, the scientist, make sure that at least they go as a team. If you have some angel investors, someone in your group of uh, sort of uh, friends and family who have sort of helped out, just make sure that you go to market with someone who's able to present your idea and to also present your sort of your long term idea. This is what we will spend the cash on now. This is what we, uh, when we anticipate that we will need cash the next time, at that point we will spend the cash like this, so that there seems like there is a plan, not just for the next six or 12 months, but also for the six, 12 months that will sort of follow uh, after that. And I think uh, at some point there needs to be uh, some uh, 
uh, some thought to or some comment to how will the investors at some point uh, get a return on uh, the money that they invest. Mm. Uh, do you foresee an exit at some point? Uh, do you foresee an IPO? Uh, do you foresee that this company will start to generate money and that the investors will get distribution? Sort of where do we see this uh, com company going? And I think you need to focus on risk. Always be very clear on what are the risks of this company, like Marsha talked about, you know, the competitive landscape, uh, where the trends, the timing, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, don't sort of try to uh, hide risk. Don't try to sort of not talk about them. Just get them out in the open and uh, talk about how you will tackle them. So uh, I think these would be sort of elements in the fundraising. So I think bottom line is that you need to really do proper homework and you know do a lot of forward planning mm. but i think there's another aspect that a lot of entrepreneurs particularly the ones that are you know a bit greener underestimate is that you should not go to an investor to sell an idea you go to an investor to sell um, a market opportunity and it's it's not only you know Back what you vision. <laughs> what you mentioned earlier exactly the, the the need and the why you are developing that because there's someone out there that needs it. It's about your capacity to influence that market and to enlarge that market. Uh, so I think that's something that many uh, uh, you know uh, entrepreneurs uh, get their uh, let's say uh, doors uh, locked or slammed uh, on their face because they don't understand. They think they have the holy grail, their idea, and they just go and sell it because it's so technically brilliant. But there's not necessarily a good understanding on who needs it, how to monetize it. But that's that's the key. If you 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 need to have that unmet medical need, you need to be able to communicate the why you are doing what you're doing. Yeah. That's that that's the key yeah. to 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 this. There's one more element that perhaps Camilla, you can also comment on. We have seen a number of companies uh, over the, the years that have done uh, sort of, I don't want to call it crowdfunding, but in some cases it is crowdfunding or it's just going to a lot of very small investors and getting a lot of people in, in the stock um, relatively on, early on, which means that you end up with an extremely large shareholder base um, very, very quickly. And that can actually be um, a negative for you for future rounds of financing when you actually go to the larger investors because they, they look at your shareholder base and you already have 80 shareholders who have contributed 20,000 to or, or 40,000 uh, kroners. So if you go down that route, it might make sense to organize your sort of crowdfunding uh, exercise into a, uh, a holding company, have a, a, a syndicate um, so that that group is facing the shareholder base as one, no. not 80 uh, shareholders. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, no, I, I fully agree because uh, if you as an investor or a, a VC fund or come into a company and there's 100 investors and the company is not registered in the VPS and it has a shareholder book and there's no shareholders agreement and it just it just becomes uh, sort of complicated and you don't know how or does anyone really control these shareholders and if you want them to vote in favor of something what will it take to get a majority for uh, certain types of resolutions how do we sort of maneuver in this company whilst if you have uh, and I think it's important that desperate time <laughs> desperate measures I can fully understand that you just need the cash so getting 20,000 uh, from you know, 100 people will add up to something, but mainly those kind of uh, call them investors will not come back with more money. So it's very much a one time investor and then you're stuck with uh, this sort of very broad big shareholder base. That's very important to man in and difficult to maneuver. So if you can at least have them invest through a vehicle, you know, set up a company again quite easily uh, to do so and then they will invest through that and uh, they can have a chunk of the company through that but you can then control the number the influence they will have in the in the company which will not necessarily uh, be uh, uh, a deterrent to no and not necessarily the same as the number of shares they have because they will be diluted it will they will always wind up with a little small portion of the shares but because there's so many 
it will complicate things. So I really agree with that. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, just one last comment on finding the right investors. You mentioned also the scouts uh, that uh, big pharma and big yeah. tech put on the ground. So any comments on whether you know is better or worse than large uh, pharma, for example? Okay, so different things. So the, the, the industry scouts are more on the BD side. Okay. So typically a pharma company will have a, a business development unit yeah. and then they will have scouts looking for technologies that fit into their pipeline. And then they have the VC vehicle, which in some cases are for pure investments in the sector or are strategic investments for their, to feed the yeah, to feed back into the, the, the company. Um, you, what I've seen in Norway is on the BD side, not so much on the VC okay. side. And the VC side of a pharma company works exactly like a VC in yeah. the normal VCs. But on the BD side, the value of that is a licensing deal. It's a, a straight out purchasing of your technology. Yeah. It's an M and A transaction or mm -hmm. a partnering. Yeah. yeah. So it's not an investment as such. Yes, as they may actually, interestingly enough, if they are interested in your sector or in your technology you may actually be able to have an R&D agreement. So mm. they sponsor a specific project with you just to see if it works and it's their their uh, their way of actually testing it before uh, an M&A transaction. And that's a very interesting uh, way to uh, to move yeah. with them. If they can get the attention of yep. large pharma. Yep. Yeah. No, that's, uh, yes. Next slide. Yes, please. Yes. So I think we've covered a lot of this. Uh, so I, I don't think I'll go uh, through line by line. Um, Camilla, you gave a very good review. I don't think we have much more on the uh, fundraising preparation and consideration, but happy to answer any questions now or later uh, if, if people want to send emails through or ask questions. So we can go to the next slide. Yep. Yeah. So the corporate governance and how you actually regulate the relationships between the different stakeholders in your organization. And here is a summary chart of the different, uh, the different stakeholders. You have your shareholders, you have your board of directors, the CEO, and below the CEO, the management team. Uh, Camilla, this is your area of expertise. <laughs> I have some experience, but I think it would be great if you could uh, take us through the corporate structure and the relationships. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So uh, we've been, I mean, we've spoken a bit now about the founders and also about the investors. So they will be uh, the shareholders. And uh, shareholders, they will uh, meet in the uh, general meeting. Uh, and that's where everything uh, that pertains to sort of the ownership structure of the company, of course, will be resolved. So. Anything that has to do uh, with equity, anything that has to do uh, with distribution of cash, anything that has to do with electing a board, uh, electing auditors, and things that sort of have to do with organizing the uh, ownership structure will happen at the general meeting. And then uh, the general meeting uh, will elect the board, which is, of course, the executive body of the um, the company and um, uh, it is uh, it man it's sort of it's the responsible it has a, a responsibility to manage the company it has a responsibility to supervise the uh, company and of course it also has a uh, liability a potential liability for any misconduct so sitting on a board uh, is a lot of responsibility and also it is something that one has to be a lot, very mindful uh, of I think. It's also very important to sort of stress that the board of uh, director is, regardless of whether or not you are elected by a shareholder, when you sit on the board, you represent all shareholders. So you're not at that point in a position to sort of represent, you're not representing the one shareholder that uh, sort of approached you and say, uh, hi, I'm, I own shares in this and this company. Uh, would you sit on the board for me? Would you represent me on the board? Uh, you may sort of have a relationship with that, but if at any point you sit on the board and you act on in the interest of that shareholder and not in the interest of the company and the joint shareholders, you will become uh, possible. You can expose yourself to liabilities. So very important to understand uh, that element. Um, 
The board of directors shall ensure that the company is properly organized uh, in a suitable, appropriate manner. And uh, the board has a duty to keep itself informed. So if the CEO doesn't properly inform the board of directors, then they have to actually go and ask if there's something uh, you want to know, if you feel that you don't get enough information about uh, everything that goes on in the company, you actually have a, a, an obligation to go and check. And then I think uh, the management of the company pertains to the board. So it's a right and an obligation. So if it has to do with management, there's never any reason for the board of directors to go to the shareholders and check with them or to have matters uh, put to the to the shareholders meeting. It's sort of the legislation and within the framework of the legislation, the board of directors uh, uh, sort of is in charge of anything that has to do with the company. Um, the board of directors will also do the planning and uh, the budgeting, and they are in charge of securing that the company has adequate uh, finances. And then one of the most important things that the board of directors does is, of course, to choose uh, the CEO of the company. Uh, the CEO of the company is in charge of keeping the accounts, which is sort of uh, in the legislation that they do. They do the daily management, uh, but they do not uh, do things of great importance or outside the uh, usual character of the company. Uh, and this is sort of, this will depend for any company what is outside uh, sort of the usual business of the company and what is of great importance. But uh, for these matters, the CEO have to uh, consult with the board of directors and the board of directors has to uh, make the decisions. So uh, the CEO basically runs the company uh, by authorization uh, from the board of directors. And then, of course, the CEO will uh, choose uh, a, a management team. And uh, I think uh, they will sort of have their uh, separate uh, areas of expertise and be in charge of separate areas. I think just uh, very quickly to comment a little bit on uh, what I said earlier about what you're interested in when you do, when you diligence a company in this space and that how important it is that uh, you have, um, you know, your IP, you have an IP strategy. The other thing that is very important when investors look at companies, uh, it is who's the board of directors and who's the management. Uh, and uh, because you're buying into these people's ability to take the company forward. Uh, and I think uh, one thing is really important and is that whoever sits, is the CEO of your company and whoever sits on your management team, make sure that they have good and proper employment contracts and very important make sure that they all have non-compete clauses in their contract because nobody wants to invest in a company where management can leave the company and start a competing business uh, sort of uh, the next day if you invest in the company, you invest in that company and you want to make sure that, you know, you already know the competitive landscape, but you also don't want there to pop up another competitor the day after you invest who has all the knowledge and who has all the expertise. And, you know, they had a good idea and said, oh, well, we'll just do everything again. Uh, and this has to do with sort of, of course, uh, that your IP has been properly protected, but this is too risky. So if an investor comes in and there's no non-compete, they will say, well, you need to get that non-compete in order. And then you have to sort of, again, start to negotiate with your employees. And they say, why? Well, no, we don't want to. Well, if we are to go accept the non-compete, then we want a higher salary or we want this and that. And then you sort of, you have the ball rolling. So this just creates problems. So before you go out, make sure that your management team is properly set up. Yes, and another point is the IP in the uh, employment contract. Um, make sure that there is uh, adequate uh, transfer of IP. Anything that is developed by the employee belongs to the company, and that the and 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 more importantly, that the employee is uh, recognizing that he or she is fairly compensated for all this IP, so that there's absolutely no discussion um, two, three, four, five years down the line uh, where they say, well, yes, it belongs to the company, but I, I didn't feel that I was fairly compensated and therefore I want royalties or whatever it is. 
um, I think there's a loophole in, in, in the legislation which could allow them to do this specifically in Norway for some for some reason. Maybe you have a comment you to know. add. On that. Yeah, I think maybe um, a lot of uh, people think that uh, the legislation is sort of bulletproof, so it's not necessary. And there is legislation on this, but uh, there are loopholes. Uh, so uh, here you want uh, uh, you want to be, I mean, better safe than sorry. So just make sure that this is in order. And so non-compete in IPR, basically. Yeah. And this also goes to show uh, potential investors that you have your ducks in a row, that you have thought about things, that you're thinking ahead, that you want to, that you're not just sort of, you didn't just start this and you know, you were so into your idea, but that you're sort of, you're able to focus on your idea and your technology, but on creating value and creating a company that investors uh, will get a return on at some point because it's well organized. So this will build trust in, uh, in the company in the shareholders and uh, uh, and in the future of the company. Yeah. You know, sorry to be so blunt. I think this makes a lot of sense. It's very elegant and every company should have this structure. But is this really realistic for a two man band or a five man band when yeah. they start? So do you, from your experience, do you see a large majority of companies having this structure with, with you know, a functioning uh, governance <laughs> structure. Uh, well, let me just comment on this. We will be, we'll revert a little bit later just to some of these. Um, this is just sort of see the corporate structure, and this is definitely where you want to wind up. I fully understand that you know if you're three founders and one is the board and one is the chairman of the board and one is the CEO, you don't have a nomination committee and audit committee and remuneration committee. <laughs> I do hope that at some point uh, you have an auditor. It's not uh, yeah. mandatory for very small companies to have it. <laughs> But to get a good accountant and to uh, further the line, get an auditor, uh, and at some point you will have to get an auditor, I think it's very important because it's a set of eyes from the outside that helps you to make sure that at least you have your accounts in order. Because if you don't have your accounts in order, uh, everything will become very complicated. Mm. And then I think it's important uh, when you start up that you don't have to be where you want to wind up, but you have to have an eye on where do I want to wind up at some point uh, and uh, where and I want to be able to show my potential investors that this is where we will wind up. We're not there yet, but we do understand the importance of it and we do understand that this is very important to you and we will collaborate with you to get us to this point when we have the time, when we have the resources and when we have a little bit of more scale. And then, of course, the basic of it, and general meeting, a board of directors and a CEO, everybody will have that. Be, yeah. yeah. I, I think a lot of companies confuse the board of directors with an advisory board. Could you okay. say a couple of words on that? And it's, so uh, just quick and then you can complement. But the fiduciary duties of the board of directors is very clearly defined, as Camilla pointed out. A scientific advisory board or a clinical advisory board has no uh, responsibility towards the company. They help you develop your technology. They guide you in your operations. So they are, you know, they, they're more advisors to the CEO and to the management team. They are below the board of directors and, and, and below the CEO in that respect. But they give you credibility from the scientific and clinical standpoint. So it's, it's a very important group. Um, and, and to have good scientific advisors or a strong scientific advisory board is a very uh, is a is a very important part of the the puzzle. Yes, I, I agree. So that's an operational uh, board. While at the board of directors, it, it, that's in the Norwegian company law. You cannot have a company without a board of directors. It can be one person, but you do need it. And then it has to have a, a substitute also. So it has to be two. Uh, so this is by law and sort of. Some of the elements that I walked you through earlier when I talked about the board of the as an executive body, that's all in the Norwegian uh, company law. So all of this is regulated. So the relationship between the shareholders, the board of director and the CEO is quite sort of um, detailed and uh, laid out in Norwegian corporate law. And you have to obey by that. Yeah. But I think there's also a difference in terms of ownership. So the advisory board has no ownership whatsoever, and the board of directors may have may, but yeah, but not necessarily. Yeah, but again, you may have advisors who who are owners as well. Yeah, 
Uh, that's not necessarily a contradiction. No, uh, not at all. Uh, and I think uh, the board of directors represent uh, the, the, the shareholders in the company, but the board of directors is also, they represent the company as such, and that's why they represent all shareholders, but they also represent uh, the employees of the company, so they also have fiduciary obligation towards the employee to make sure that the employees are taken well care of, and they have uh, fiduciary obligations towards creditors. So that would mean if you have uh, external financing through loans, which startups may not have, but uh, if you have uh, grants, if you have contributions, etc., they will also be uh, obligated to take care of all these stakeholders. And then there is sort of a maybe a bit of a theoretical discussion, at least among lawyers, to what extent also a company has, and uh, the board has uh, obligations towards other stakeholders than actually its owners and its creditors and its employees, like uh, sort of the society as a whole, you know. Uh, you have, it's a huge responsibility. It's a huge responsibility, <laughs> uh, ESG, environmental issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. that you have to sort of also uh, take into consideration the general trends in the company and sort of try to, try to cater for that into your company. Yeah. Well, and, and this is now being, uh, we see it in the policies that we implement in the corporate governance actually more yeah. and more uh, as a way forward. We have a question from uh, Jonas. Uh, Jonas, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Um, regarding the board of directors uh, and recruitment, to a board, uh, is it? Uh, it has been discussed. I've, I've followed some uh, uh, guidance in Denmark or webinars in Denmark regarding uh, this issue regarding recruitment and compensation. Uh, and I, I'm specifically thinking of early stage, uh, like startups, uh, that has which they don't have. Most of us don't have that much funds. To, uh, for compensation, is it expected to be compensated, and how is it expected to be compensated, and uh, how much um, at an early stage? Um, we have a whole slide on this topic in two slides from now. Uh, so can we can we address your question? Let's let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, that's okay. So first, just very quickly, and, and Jonas, the next slide is, is on building a board. So if we just take a few yeah. seconds on, uh, on building a management team so that we don't uh, risk our technological uh, issues, mm -hmm. <laughs> we go to slide by slide. So um, just very quickly uh, to look at building a management team. One of the issues that we have seen is uh, it's linked to lack of funding. It's linked to a lot of, you know, the startup uh, situation where we have the founder, the CEO, um, basically taking on all the um, all the responsibilities and all the activities of the company. So being becoming an expert uh, accountant, an expert business development, financier, soft funding uh, uh, applications, preclinical developer, clinical reimbursement, basically adding skills to their own personal re repertoire, um, which we do understand is is often the only way when you are on a tight budget. But whenever possible, it's very important to find expertise and build your team. It will help you move your project forward faster and more efficiently. So choosing the right, um, you know, if it's if you have a budget for one or two more people alongside you, make sure that you choose those people according to the core responsibilities that need to be filled to complement what you have already at the table. Um, we often get the question about hiring employees or consultants. Um, of course, there are issues both sides. Um, hiring employees, uh, you you know, it's it, it can be very expensive if you get it wrong. But it is a, very important that you start to build uh, knowledge inside the company as uh, as quickly as possible, as opposed to having consultants on your core activity. So. Again, this is a balance and, and, and something that you need to, to think about. But of course, building the team in-house is important on the long run. And then on compensation, um, and that was back to the point that Sergio made earlier, 
um, having employees who share the risk and the success of the company is extremely important. So having an option scheme in place for the company and ensure that uh, your employees are there for the long term is something that we as investors definitely value, especially when you when you are uh, talking about those core responsibilities. But Camilla, I'll let you just take the the lead on the um, on the option schemes and what's what we see in Norway. What you recommend um, the the management teams to think about? Yes, um, I think uh, it's 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 a very it's a very tricky point for uh, especially for early phase companies. Uh, everything that has to do with how do you build a management team because. Uh, you don't necessarily have a lot of cash, so you can't sort of uh, pay out uh, uh, sort of uh, big salaries that compete with sort of more established companies to get the good people on board. And uh, and for that reason, I think it's important to understand that your commodity is a little bit your equity at this point, but it's not free to give away that equity. And for the discussions about consultants or employees, and we had a question about that earlier, whether or not should you pay your consultant with equity? Well, you know, that might seem like a good idea uh, at first, but then you have one consultant and you give uh, him or she, you know, 5% of the company and you still have 95% left. And then after three months, that consultant is gone and, you know, that work is done. And then you have a new sort of uh, new, uh, new job that needs to be done and you get a new consultant and then you give away 5% more. And then it sort of, it adds up. And this is not, it's, you need to sort of, as a founder, keep as much equity as you can, because at the moment where cash comes in from third parties, from investors, there will be dilution. And you don't want to have given away too much uh, of your shares at an early stage. So just be very mindful of that. Uh, when it comes to uh, your employees, you want them to be uh, somehow invested in the company. And I think uh, there's sort of different ways to incentivize your uh, employees. Of course, you can give them uh, uh, you can give them cash bonuses when you achieve something, but this will require cash, which is difficult. Then you can give them shares, which is a, quite a good uh, alternative um, that uh, your employees can buy shares. The problem is that if the employees are to buy shares, they will need uh, cash themselves in order to buy these shares uh, if you do a, a share issue towards employees and if you have a very low valuation then that might not be uh, so problematic but if you have a higher valuation then it becomes more problematic because they don't necessarily have that kind of cash to be able to uh, buy the shares. The good things about owning shares is of course that they get influence from day one uh, and you know they really you know if the company does better, then they do better. If it does worse, so they're very sort of vested. They have ownership in it. And here, I think it's just a key point that you can have employees buy shares at a lower value than uh, market price uh, and try to avoid uh, the tax uh, effects of that by uh, having them have a lock up on uh, their shares. If you have employees that do not have uh, the opportunity to buy shares, then you can give them options. And options is really not, um, it's not like owning shares, it's to own, it's the right to buy a share at a certain, uh, at a certain point in time. So you do not own the company uh, and you will not have any rights in the company until your options are vested and you have um, and you have issued shares uh, to them. Um, for option schemes, there's really there's no sort of uh, lo the law on option schemes in Norway. So it's just an uh, agreement between the company and the shareholders uh, and uh, whoever uh, is going to have the options. And, uh, you know, there's freedom of agreement. So you can basically uh, agree to uh, most things that you would want to and what you would normally regulate in an option scheme is number of, uh, of shares that uh, you can uh, buy or subscribe for, uh, the price that are to be paid uh, when uh, the options are converted into shares, when this will happen, whether you know in different stages, you know, 
uh, from your options, uh, you know, one third will invest the first year and third, one third the year after, et cetera, et cetera, to have, so at least situation. And also uh, if they will best at certain point, you know, if there's certain milestones when we get to this and this point, then uh, so many of the shares will best, et cetera, like that. But, but, but to this point, Camilla, I think, I mean, from our point of view, it's, it's always good to have options linked to some form of performance yeah. and if you if you need to incentivize someone to come on board with you and and you d decide to go for an option package make sure that it's not something that they get up front but that they get uh, over time that it's back ended so that you don't have uh, back loaded so that you don't have everything up front and then they leave after you know a year and you <laughs> you have options uh, that they you know as a good lever bad lever clause that they still have whatever was vested at the time yeah yeah i agree very important and i think uh if uh the what well, the thing about the options is of course that there's no risk for the employees to that because when you own shares if the company goes belly up then you lose your money and if it goes really well then you make a profit uh, with options it's not the same thing so there there's it's an it's a way to incentivize them to make sure that these options become in the money so they work really hard to make sure that they uh, have a profit and then in norway uh, options are not uh, very tax favorable but i would uh, still say that for most companies it's still uh, the way that we uh, that you would uh, that you would set up an option scheme in order to have your employees uh, incentivized and i think Many sort of organizations that work with startups are continuously trying to lobby with uh, the government to try and make them more uh, tax uh, efficient. efficient. Yeah. Very good. So now, Jonas, we're going to building the board mm -hmm. and uh, answering your, your question. Um, so, Camilla, you've mentioned the fiduciary duties of the board. Uh, mm. Perhaps just a just a few you know key bullet points here um, on this first uh, on this first point. Yes, I think uh, I mentioned it a little bit. I think uh, I will repeat what I said earlier. How important it is that uh, board members are uh, the representatives of the company. They can sign for the company. They make the important decisions of the company and they are responsible for the equity of the company. They represent all shareholders and uh, it's by law they are not allowed to uh, do, uh, make any decisions that is in the favor of one shareholder uh, and to the detriment of the rest of the shareholders. So these, uh, this is very uh, important and I think uh, also from a confidential point all shareholders are supposed to get the same information so if you uh, sit on the board and you're a board member and you feel that you're sort of elected on behalf of one shareholder you're actually not allowed to share lots of information with that shareholder that the rest of the board uh, the rest of the shareholders do not have access to so it's very important to understand that once you're on the board you're a step away from whoever uh, you think elected you because you're elected by the shareholders uh, jointly to serve the best interest of the company um, for the best of everyone. And uh, there is quite a lot of liability uh, uh, linked to sitting on the board uh, that uh, maybe uh, board members do not think about. So um, we would, of course, recommend that uh, at some point, uh, if possible, uh, that one do uh, take out an insurance for uh, any liability that a board member uh, can be exposed to. Yeah, no, very good point. The second point, how to select uh, your board members. And here I, I'll just start uh, from my own experience. W one of the things um, I see a lot of uh, issues with having board members who become consultants to the company. and we would really advise against that. Uh, it, it just confuses the whole governance because you have your, your shareholders, your board and the management team and suddenly you have someone who's on the board who then ends up reporting to the CEO who reports back to that person up in the board. It confuses everybody um, and, and it, it blurs the lines. So first rule, not employees and not consultants, not someone who is part of the management team when you get to a certain stage. Of course, if it's only three of you, 
I, you know, I, I understand, but when, when you have a certain size and you have external, external or capital providing shareholders, it's very important that the lines are very clean and kept that way. Um, Camilla, you, you want to take us through other, the other points? Um, yes, I think just, uh, just also put the technical that uh, there are also in Norwegian corporate law, there's sort of uh, rules on who can be elected on the board. So it needs to be a person of, uh, uh, of a legal age and there's sort of certain disqualifying periods. I think it's also important to know that uh, the uh, CEO and half of the members of the board of directors needs to reside in Norway or in the EU. And uh, just sort of as a little comment, if you have uh, UK citizens yeah. on your board uh, after Brexit, uh, they issue. will no longer be uh, EU citizens. So this can actually uh, entail that certain boards who fulfill their uh, obligation to have half uh, EU citizens will not have a problem. So if you have UK citizens on your board, that can cause a problem. But you can apply for dispensation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, then uh, I think when you sort of uh, elect the board, I think uh, it's you have to look at the actual need of the company uh, and that sort of the optimal compensation will vary from company to company, of course. Uh, but I think uh, it's important to sort of uh, uh, get different sort of competence and complementary composition uh, to the board, also given what uh, the competence of uh, the management uh, team is. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, different stages, I sort of. Uh, yeah, so, so what, one of the things um, I would like to bring to your attention on the point on the nomination committee, it becomes to to the question about compensation and how to compensate your board members. I think it's important when you have professional board members or people who are coming in um, who are not part of your founder team, um, who are either chosen by you know by you and your, your environment, but people who can really contribute to your company, you need to have some form of compensation. When you have capital providing shareholders on board, you should think about using them and the, the, the existing shareholder base basically to put together a nomination committee that is separate from the management team, separate from the board, but that will be able to help in, um, in, in uh, bringing the board together and also uh, putting forth recommendations on compensation for the board members. There, it's a lot of work. I sit on a number of boards. I have to say it's a lot of work and it's, it's, it's difficult to bring board members onto boards um, without having anything to offer. You won't get their time, you won't get their commitment. They'll be there, it's good to have because they're a strong name or they have a, they have a network, but they may not tap into it because they have no incentive. So thinking about how to, uh, how to compensate the board and keeping it a little bit outside the management and the board itself and having this, uh, this uh, nomination committee um, that basically is your um, alibi for uh, board election and board compensation is a good way forward. Um, again, different stages of your life cycle require different types of board members and different compensation packages. So, of course, uh, early stage people don't expect huge amounts, but you have ways of, of dealing with, um, with the compensation. It can be uh, as Camilla pointed out, for the management team, this uh, RSU or sort of a discounted share issue towards the board members specifically, where they have so a discount um, to the valuation and uh, they are locked in for a period of time. Do, do, you, do you want to give your views as well uh, on this, uh, Camilla? Yes, I think. Uh, I think it's true that uh, before you have professional investors in, in the company, I think uh, you will probably be able to get uh, people who sit on the board who will not necessarily require uh, a lot of compensation. But from the time when you get uh, investors into the company and your company is in the next phase and it's sort of becoming more professionalized, then you also need to build your board uh, in a professional manner. And at that point, I think uh, some sort of compensation will be good. And uh, rule of thumbs, if you have, uh, if you buy uh, shares at a discount of between, 
yeah, 20 to 30 percent, and you have a lock off uh, on those shares for three years, and saying that you cannot sell the shares for for three years, then you will not be taxed as salary for the benefit of buying the shares at a discount. So uh, this would be a way to incentivize board members that they are. Uh, uh, sort of invested in the company because uh, their shares will become uh, much more worth if they uh, if the company does well. The fact that they get the discount means that you know you have a bit of an extra incentive, uh, and it doesn't uh, involve a cash component on uh, on the company. We we can stop here and and see if there are any questions on this. I, I don't know if. Um... Yeah. Maybe we go back to Jonas if your question was answered or if you still have anything on your, ma in your mind. Uh, no, thank you. Um, it is kind of just to find out and draw the picture of what kind, what different kinds of opportunities do you have to recruit uh, key uh, members to a board for a, for a startup. Uh, and that was uh, that was good. Uh, in in I know in one of the webinars I participated in in Denmark they. Uh, they actually brought it up as a red flag in early stage if a board member really wanted a, a fairly large uh, compensation in in the in in the manner of of money uh, then uh, then companies should kind of think them have a have a thought through it, whether that would be the right uh, way but um discounted shares and and things like that uh, yeah that was a, that was inspirational but that Thank we you. totally agree um, on the red flag if they want a huge cash compensation. So trying to find uh, alternatives in order to be able to recruit a good board is really um, this is where this discounted uh, share issue is a is a good option. Yeah, very good. Any further questions from the group? OK, look like so we can move forward move to, or? The, yep, to the next slide which is about setting up the committees. Um, I think to Camilla's point, it, this is uh, maybe a little bit too, uh, it's, it's something that uh, you need to plan for. M my only comment personally is on this nomination committee. It can just solve a lot of uh, political issues that you may have with, uh, with your shareholder base, with your management team, with your board, if you have this, this nomination committee helping or facilitating the election of the board and the compensation uh, package. But Camilla, I'll, I'll leave you to. Yes, I think, that's, I think that's correct. I mean, uh, down the line, uh, this is what companies will look like and should look like. Uh, in, the, in the startup phase, uh, we never see it. And I agree uh, that it comes uh, further down. But I think that Marsha is right that the nomination committee is uh, the committee that we see the first. Uh, and it's not sort of it's not regulated in in corporate law or anything. So this is sort of uh, many of these committees are uh, something that you know would be considered good corporate governance and that you regulate internally in your company. Uh, but the nomination committee is important because the board of directors is so important in a company uh, with uh, limited resources uh, where you need to make sure that you have the best board to sort of. Uh, assist and drive the company forward and then you don't uh, you think you you hope to get a more professional board of directors if there's a nomination committee that sort of brings some objectivity to how you elect the board so this is why we sort of recommend that at the early early stage yep. So regulating the relationship between the shareholders, the board and the management, we've, we've touched upon this along the way, um, but just to, uh, to bring to your attention some of these key uh, uh, relationships and, and, and the types of agreements or, or documents you could, that you can have in place. So the first one is the shareholder agreement to regulate the relationship between shareholders. Camilla? Uh, yes, um, I think... Uh, um, Quite a lot of the relationship between shareholders is regulated in Norwegian corporate law. Uh, so, uh, you know, one share, one vote, uh, this happens at the General Assembly. Uh, it uh, takes, you know, 50% to elect the board. It takes two thirty, two third uh, to sort of uh, change the bylaws, to decide on equity, mergers, etc. 
So uh, a lot of uh, the relationship between uh, the shareholders is regulated in, uh, uh, in, sh in the company law. Still, we do tend to think that shareholders agreement is, is a good idea because you don't necessarily want the uh, exact regulation which uh, you will find in uh, Norwegian corporate law. Uh, and you want to find maybe different sort of solutions. I think also um, quite a few investors will insist on it. So even to have it between the founders, like we talked about earlier on, so that they agree to how will we uh, behave when an investor comes in and they will request so that we already at the start agree, okay, we will do so, so, and so, so that not one person can veto and say, oh no, we will not sell shares, we will not try to get this done, etc. Uh, and then when your uh, the investors come in, uh, very, very often they have, if at least if it's a, if it's an, uh, a venture fund or a corporate uh, fund or institution, they will insist on it. And I think it's good at that point that you're prepared for what comes, uh, what you will have to accept and that there's not much you can do about uh, and what you can sort of really uh, get. Um, um, I think many of the things that you will uh, sort of discuss a lot about in a shareholders agreement are uh, the right of first refusal, it's uh, the tag along, it's the drag along, it's exit, how to exit the company, uh, it's non compete, it's uh, board composition, it's board composition, it's uh, who should, how can you sell shares, lock up, uh, lock in periods, uh, what, uh, how should you uh, own your own shares, uh, how can you sort of uh, sell from one company to another. Um, uh, how to vote, uh, what kind of veto rights should someone have, etc., etc. So, uh, shareholders agreement, really uh, quite fun agreements. Uh, we lawyers like them a lot. Really, really tricky. And you try to regulate uh, a lot of things. And the only sort of rule of thumb is that the one thing that people wind up fighting about is the one thing you didn't regulate. Um, but I do tend to think it's really important to enter into them when everybody is uh, sort of friendly and everybody wants the same thing for the company because they give good, they give a good compass, it gives a bit of a moral guideline to where we want to go. And then if, uh, God forbid, somewhere down the, long, the line people start to disagree, then you still have some sort of framework that will yeah. help you and guide you through it. Very complete. I think yeah. the lockup period is something that uh, does come up with uh, with founders, with the innovators. When when uh, investors come on board, they want to, you know, we we often like to um, lock people up for a few years so you don't sell shares as 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 the financing ends and and you know and and move on to something else. Um, corporate governance manual to regulate the relationship between the board and the company, uh, the management. Uh, that again is something that probably at an early stage is not uh, is not that necessary or that important uh, as long as the lines of communication are good. But it's 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 it would be something to think about and at least know about um, at the stage uh, at the early stage so that you have the right guidelines and and you know what you're doing. Camilla, some views on that? From no, I think uh, I think this this comes along the. <laughs> along the, uh, the way, but and I think uh, many times when you hear, you know, corporate governance manual, you hear corporate governance, oh, you know, what does that mean? And you feel that like you have to produce some big document. And all companies have corporate governance. It's the way you govern your company. It's the way you have your meetings. It's the way you summon them. It's the way you minute them, etc. So as you go along and you sort of start to doing things in a certain way, just sort of write it down and say, okay, this is the way we do it. And then you build your corporate governance uh, from there. Uh, and uh, in some way, it's just about being mindful of how you operate your company day to day, how you operate between the board uh, and the management. And then uh, little by little, you will have a corporate governance manual. And it's not something that you have to go and buy from someone. It's not something that you have to look online and you know you find a 20-page document and you have to implement. You implement it as you go along, 
and then you put it down on paper. And then after a while, you can sort of uh, take inspiration from manuals that you can find elsewhere, or you can borrow from someone else who has a company and see if they have certain elements that, oh, this would be good for our company as well. So just build it as you long, go along and document. The, the level of communication between the board and the management is, is, uh, is an important point. Um, so, and again, this is part of the corporate governance. So how often do you need to meet? Um, respecting the lines of communication, the hierarchy between the board and the management, making sure that you don't have board members communicating directly to, um, to a, an employee without going through either the chair or the, the, or the CEO. It just confuses the lines and it confuses people. So understanding how the, the, the lines of communication um, should be observed just to make sure that you don't have side discussions and, 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 and confusion um, that you don't need to have. I think that's, uh, that yeah. covers it. Um, uh, strategy and method for keeping current shareholders updated. Again, this is the point uh, that Camilla was making earlier. Um, the, all shareholders have a right to the same information. So making sure that you have maybe quarterly newsletters uh, that goes out to all the shareholders. Um, you have your AGM, all those things, you know, thinking about how to communicate with the shareholders. The decisions for the board and the decisions for the general assemblies. This is something that can get a little bit confusing if you want to change your bylaws, uh, articles of association. Is that a board decision? Is that a general assembly? Well, it's a general assembly decision, but it's not obvious. Um, so these are things that if you don't know, you need to ask. But perhaps you, Camilla, you've probably seen some of these issues popping up. Yes. Basically, the point that, uh, like I stated before, that the, the, uh, the corporate law has clear regulation on who does what. Uh, and uh, if you do not know, uh, and I think that's a fair point, you know, it's this is then just figure it out, ask someone and get a little bit of help with it so that uh, you get your uh, decisions made in the right uh, format. The last point is company history and um, good corporate governance really dictates keeping good minutes and having good protocols. And please, archiving is important. Making sure that you have your documentation, that you have everything in order. This will make your life so much easier when it comes to due diligence and or, or just general running of the company. If you have a transfer from one CEO to another or if something happens and the management team you, you you need to have good um, good archiving uh, and and your your books your your books in order basically. Okay, and the last point is the internal processes. Um, we we just wanted to uh, bring to your attention the employee handbook and the authority matrix or contract matrix. So th very quickly, the employee handbook is something that all companies uh, should at some point have. Again, probably not on day one, but at some point, it's just how you operate as a management team. What do you do if someone is on sick leave? Uh, do you do you compensate them on top of what they are able to get from NAV? Um, what is the pension? Uh, how do you reimburse uh, travel, the working hours? onboarding of new employees, what is the uh, what are the steps? So these are just very basic uh, basic items, but important to have in place so that you don't get um, caught by surprise if you know something happens and and you know you don't have any regulations on how to deal with your employees. No, I think it, I, I agree. And I think also this is something that is often built as you go along the way. Uh, you know, when you have something that hasn't happened to you before, you, for the first time someone is sick, then you figure out, OK, how do we deal with that? Just OK, that's and you figure out oh, we dealt with it like this. It was a good idea. You find out from someone else how they did it and then you do it and uh, and then you write it down and then you have an employee handbook. And the authority contract matrix is basically uh, just make sure that everybody knows what's in within their authority and what's not. Uh, you don't want some uh, uh, sort of, uh, you don't want an intern being able to do a purchase on behalf of the company. So it needs to be important who can do your purchases, uh, who can enter into contracts, 
uh, if you sell, who can sell? If you want to sell at a discount, can that be decided uh, by whoever, or does that need to be raised to a different level, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So that you have to get sort of a stringent uh, organization. Very good. This brings us to the um, last uh, couple of slides. I think we are slowly getting to the end of our, our time. Um, basically, we've talked about having an idea to defeat an unmet medical need, establishing a company, and now we get to the last stage, which is getting ready for either partnering, exit, or, or IPO. Uh, we won't spend too much time on that, but um, if we go to the next slide, on you know, just obviously looking at an M&A and partnering, we have the example of Avexis, which was bought by Novartis. Um, basically a uh, massive uh, success uh, for uh, the shareholders of Avexis, but there's a whole process behind an M&A and, and doing your business development. Then on the other side, some of you have seen, or hopefully all of you have seen, uh, you know, the Vaxibody story with, with the deal that uh, was announced a few weeks ago, uh, while share price went from 19 kroners in January 2020 to close to 60 kroners today. So again, you know, you're, you're getting ready for this type of, um, of situation is important. Yes, and I think I think this is a lecture of its own, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> but just to bring it, so yeah. we're just, yeah. just, just briefly commenting on it. Yeah, yeah. and the last point, it's been, uh, it, it's been in the news so much. I mean, Mercure Market, uh, or as it's called now, Euronext Growth, is definitely something that um, some of you should consider at some point in order to raise uh, raise money. Um, it opens up access to uh, larger pockets. Institutional investors are uh, active on Mercury Market, but there are some requirements. And I'll, uh, Camilla, I'll let you comment on, on what a company needs to have in place uh, to some extent. Yeah, I think, I mean, we can probably uh, Very revert quickly. to the more details uh, at any point. If anybody has any questions, just feel free to reach out. Um, I think uh, the important thing is that Mercury Markets or Euronext Growth, as it's called now, uh, the requirements uh, to be listed there are uh, fewer and they're not as complicated as if you do a, a full uh, IPO. It's become increasingly popular. Uh, like we say, in 2019, three companies were admitted, and a year to date, uh, I did this on the 19th of November, 37, 37 companies have been admitted. So it's been really, really popular this year. Um, and uh, I think it's good because uh, um, the calculation of wealth tax is based on book value, not on market capitalization. So for wealth tax, it's a good place uh, to be. And uh, you become very quickly a professional company and it doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take uh, a very complicated listing process and it doesn't take a lot of money to be listed uh, here. Uh, and what you basically need is to speak with an investment bank uh, and they will sort of give you a, a heads up or, you know, whoever your lawyer is or come speak with us and we can sort of give you a heads up on how to do this. But it's it, it works quite well uh, yeah. moment. and it's not that uh, time consuming um, as Camilla said. So this brings us to to the end uh, for today. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, I think we have a, a, a couple of minutes, but otherwise happy to answer questions by email or, or other.